when we come to Christ and realize this is what Christ does in us. This is what Christ does in our spirit. This is what Christ does in our relationships. Everything should be under subjection to him. But what happens? Well, let's just go to the gospel and see what happens. This is what happens. This is the reality. There is ideals and then there's reality. There is God's standards and then there's evil coming into the world. And so one of the things I want to just remind you of today as we look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, 2 to 16, which is mainly about Christ talking about divorce because people like to know about these things. Why do we want to know about these things? Well, it's pretty obvious. When people come to us, and when they come to us as pastors or leaders, or if they come to us as counsellors and psychotherapists, quite often, often and, and maybe even if you're in the law to, to solicitors and lawyers, people come to see how far they can go before they're in trouble. What can I do to do what I want without getting into trouble? It's, we're talking about boundaries and we're talking about the law. And we're also talking about scriptures and the law and rules and regulations and God's standards. So there's, a, there's an essence here where we have to be very careful because as human beings we have our own agendas, we have our own lusts, we have our own wants and desires and so we need to use scripture to interpret scripture. You've heard me say that many times. This is what hermeneutics are all about. It's using scripture to interpret scripture. Now, when I look at any scripture, whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament, I'm filtering it through what Christ has said. I'm filtering it through Christ's understanding of the law and yet his, his viewpoint from a loving perspective and a merciful perspective. It says several times in the New Testament, God says, I require mercy, not sacrifice. This is, this is the stance of Christ. I require mercy, not sacrifice. I want to see the law through love. And so scripture interprets scripture rather than the pure rules. That's what we're looking at. There were two commands that Jesus gave. And when you really love, that's a gift of God. It's a gift of God. You can't see the commandments as those two that Jesus said. Oh, you can hear them. Oh, you can know them. But you can't act upon them unless you have that gift of love from God unless God has changed your heart and it's about honoring loving and honoring in God and this is the same with relationships there needs to be this three-way relationship this has said love between God and, and and man and his wife together and this is what transcends selfishness you see we can manipulate the scriptures and the laws as much as we want to, but it doesn't make it right. And what happens in relationships, when we marry the wrong person because we haven't married in God, maybe we were too hasty, maybe we were foolish, maybe we were deceived, maybe what was presented what wasn't the reality, maybe we have been duped, and maybe we weren't as perfect as we thought we were either. And therefore we have caused problems as well. But one of the most important things is when we are not really following God, when we're not really living in God's love and living to, to please God, when we're trying to please ourselves, we're automatically in a relationship saying, what am I getting from this? How is this good for me? Am I getting my needs met? Is this person being, you know, giving me the love that I want? Is this person doing everything that I want that makes me feel that they love me? And so there is a selfishness there. And when things go a bit wrong, and when we're, when we're at odds with each other, because there's conflict in all relationships, there always will come some conflict if it's alive. If it's dead, maybe not. But if it's an alive relationship, and people are thinking people, and people have their opinions and they have their their ideas and their their you know their hopes and dreams and sometimes we can we can have hopes and dreams that are the same but sometimes 
A partner can dash our hopes or our dreams because they've misunderstood or because they've spoken in a way at some time that a person can't understand and so their hopes may be dashed or they may have misunderstood and sometimes there's, there's lots of miscommunication in relationship. One of the things we do in couples counselling is nearly always about getting them to really listen to one another because there's such a problem with communication because we have completely different minds. The female mind and the male mind are completely different. We think differently. We act differently. There's many things that we don't do the same. Adam was created first and Eve was created as a companion, the only one comparable to him. So comparable in the sense that we have intelligence, comparable in the sense that we have a soul and a live spirit, the spirit that is either dead or alive in Christ and we're either walking in the spirit or not together. And so there is a comparison between us. It's not like I'm married to a monkey or an ape. There's no comparison. They wouldn't be able to speak my language. They would want to do things that I don't want to do. They wouldn't have any real social graces. <laughs> but at the same time, there is a completion between the man and the woman. This is why it's talked of as Adam's rib when we talk about, you know, I've got my rib, you know, because it's someone who completes me. There is a comparison, but there's also a completion. And that God brings us together in the right way, and it's God who brings us together through our soul qualities and our relationship with God, we can have this wonderful relationship. And when we look at this, these, this chapter here, which as I say can be very contentious for a lot of people, and you know, there's a great deal of responsibility to actually look at this and, and say what I believe God is saying to me about these, these scriptures. Because on first reading, it looks like, you know, Christ is down on everyone who's got divorced. And Christ is down on anyone that even thinks about it. And Christ is down on anyone that can't make a go of their relationship. So you must have failed. You're now a wounded soldier. You can't do anything for God because now you're divorced. But I don't see this in the scriptures because I'm interpreting scriptures in with scriptures. And so what I'm seeing here when I look behind these verses, I'm seeing first of all there are ideals between the Christian and the non-Christian. Now, you know, when Moses gave a certificate of divorce, it says their hearts were hard. Now we know at that time their hearts were very, very hard and they were always moaning to Moses and they were always saying, you know, where's God? You know, he's not there, he's not open. So their hearts were hard to God and also their hearts were hard to one another. And this was at a time when a man could divorce his wife just for burning the meal, you know, or, or, or not doing the dishes. <laughs> say, uh, I divorced thee, I divorced thee, I divorced thee three times, that's it, it's all over. She's now second rate, chucked out the house, nobody's looking after her, and in that time, we're talking warrior tribes people, we're talking, you know, if you're out of the tribe, you're out, and you're on the street, and so you didn't have anyone to, to have your back. And so we're looking at the difference now, he's talking to Jews, and he's talking to people that aren't necessarily saved. And even his disciples ask him again, because he's talking to the Jews. Many of them were not saved at this point. And so we're talking about ideals of Christianity and seeing the comparison between non-Christian ideals and, and, and ways of being. So we're looking at the difference between love and responsibility. This is what I'm seeing in these verses, the difference between love and responsibility. We're looking at the difference between living in sin and marriage, in relationships. We're looking at the difference between separation and divorce. We're looking at the difference between selfishness and selflessness and giving. We're looking at the letter of the law and the spirit of the law and understanding the difference. And so we're looking about the fact that it's all about the intention of our hearts. It's all about the intention of what we do and our acts. And either we're going to follow what God is telling us is the right way 
or we're going to manipulate it to our own ends. And so, because the, the certificate was given at that time to Moses, to, to, to issue a, a decree of divorce, a certificate of divorce, because people's hearts were hardened, and if a woman was able to be divorced, she could get remarried. That was the whole point of it. The point of giving the certificate was so that she was not just thrown out as second-rate goods, used and abused, and therefore would never be able to be married again because she was a divorced woman. The certificate was allowing the person to remarry. But you've got to look at the intention behind it. Now, it says here, in verse 2, the Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? They were testing him. So they knew the law. So why were they testing him? Well, because they knew that Jesus was a bit of a rebel, that he wasn't following the way of the Jewish elders and leaders at the time. And they were very legalistic and very judgmental. They didn't even want him to heal on the Sabbath. This is a different... they following rules to the point of rules. And basically he says... And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? So he's saying, look, you know the law. What does Moses say? Don't, don't come with this old malarkey. <laughs> What's Moses say about this? You've got it in your law. What does it say? And they said, obviously, Oh, well, Moses permitted a, a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And yet there were times when Jesus did other things, like the woman who was actually had four husbands and she was with another one. Someone was caught in adultery and what did he say? You who are without sin cast the first stone. And then he tells her to go and sin no more. But the point's made. They knew what kind of person he was. They knew that he was all about love and grace and mercy. And so Jesus answers and said to them in verse 5, because of the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. So it's because of the hardness of your heart. Did it make it right? No. But at the same time, should people suffer because it's not right to divorce? That's what he's saying. Should you allow people to suffer and be in a relationship that is abusive or causing problems or not honouring to God or not following God? No. There are times when we have to step back and say this is an abusive relationship. This is not honouring to God, this relationship. This is not where I want to be. I want to be following God. I want to be in a, a relationship with God. And so my relationship in this situation is not honouring to God and it's not going the right way. Why does it say, why, does, why are we told that you mustn't be unequally yoked? This is it. This is the crux of it all. Don't get into the relationship in the first place. Don't be unequally yoked with someone who is not a godly person who does not want to solo, follow and serve God and honour God and, and keep to God's standards. This is what he's saying. And he says, but from the beginning, in verse 6, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. So he's reiterating once more what we read earlier in Genesis, that God made us male and female. And it says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. So there is a need to be joining. But the joining has to take place before God. It needs to take place under God. It needs to be a godly relationship. When they were in Canaan and they were intermarrying, what happened is they were then starting to follow other gods. It wasn't good. And they were even told to separate from them. They were told when they were in Canaan to get away from these people that they'd married to, that it was totally out of order, that they weren't equally yoked, and they were told to leave them and to separate from these people. Wow. So, this is interesting. So, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. So in Christ, 
In God we become one flesh. How can you become one flesh with someone who's not in God? It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. You're unequally yoked. You're not in a right relationship with someone in that situation. And people make mistakes. And some people say they're Christians and they get married to other Christians and then it turns out that they're doing everything the opposite. They're not honouring their partner. They're not bringing their children in, up in God's, wa- God's standards and God's ways. And they're doing completely the opposite. And they may be professing that they're Christians. They may be professing that they're people of faith. Or they may go into it saying, well, I don't mind if you go to church. I'm not really saved, but I don't mind if you go to church. And people think, well, that's okay. They'll come round. No, they won't. If it happens, that's amazing. But, and there are times when people have had people that are in a relationship that, that suddenly meets with God. You know, we can't say when we're going to come to God and we can't predict if someone else is going to come to God. And all our efforts of being good and following God's standards and putting Bibles on the table and putting Christian books in, up, up under their noses and, you know, inviting them to church and inviting them to men's meetings and all, none of this can make someone a Christian. Only the Holy Spirit, only God in His grace and His mercy can draw someone out to become a believer and so that is presumption that we presume that if we marry someone that doesn't mind if we continue with our faith then they'll get saved eventually that is foolishness and presumption and it's wrong and so this is where it heads this is what happens when you do that and we make mistakes and verse 9 says therefore what God has joined together let not man separate so if God has joined a relationship if this relationship is in Christ if this is a truly godly marriage where you both are following God this is a hesed marriage then let nobody no one separate that marriage no one Verse 10, in the house his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So the disciples are confused now. Disciples are starting to get confused because they're not seeing the spiritual side. Quite often they're seeing the legal, they're actually listening to what the Pharisees say. They're listening to what they already know the law themselves. And they're starting to think, what, what's he talking about? You know, he's being a bit harsh here. This is not like Jesus. Why is he being so harsh? But they're missing the point in the way he talks in parables. And the t- there's spiritual undertones to this that we're not necessarily getting. The fact that he said your hearts were hard, that was your clue. Non-believer, hardened heart. When you become a believer, you have a renewed heart. Yes? Amen? And so he says, he goes further now. When his disciples ask him, he goes further. He says, so he said to them, Verse 11, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. So, it then comes down to the reality of actually taking out a divorce and actually divorcing someone. You actually going to the courts and divorcing someone. And if you are both in Christ, that is an anathema. That is wrong. If you are not in a godly relationship, there are different rules that apply. And so we need to understand that. But he does, he brings a double whammy here because he, he doesn't just leave it there that, you know, if a man wants to divorce his wife, you know, Moses has given him a certificate of divorce. Like it's all on the man's head. He's the spiritual head. He should take responsibility. But then he says something else, which also gives us a clue. Verse 12 says, And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So now, what he's talking about is selfishness. What he's talking about is we can all plan things. We can all decide we don't want to be party to something that we don't want. And if we start to get in the flesh and in worldliness, we start to want things that we're not supposed to have. We can find reasons. Hello? We can find reasons to get what we want. We can manipulate the rules to get what we want. 
We can even push someone into doing something to get what we want. But there are certain things that we do know about Christ, with certain things we do know about the Scriptures, and that is that we are supposed to live in harmony. And we're supposed to bring our children up the same way. And we're supposed to be in God together as two believers. And that is the unit that God has created that should not divorce, that should never be divorced. And there may be problems and things may happen and there are times when things go wrong. And some people, because their hearts are hardened, they will separate out from their partners in that situation or they'll separate for the right reasons because their partner's not following God and they want to bring peace to their house. And we're also told in the New Testament by Paul that if an unbeliever wants to leave, you must let them leave. So it's actually a command. You're never commanded to divorce because someone upsets you, because someone doesn't do the dishes, or because someone, you know, has a drink and you don't like them drinking, or talks to someone you don't like them talking to, or does something or buys something or gets something or works in a certain way or does something that you don't like. That we're never told to divorce for those reasons. This is human nature. This is what we do. This is how we have to work out these conflicts. We have to work them out from a position of loving one another. If we can do that, then we're doing really well. And there are times when very big things happen that really can upset us. And again, love covers a multitude of sins, we're told. If you really love the person in God, and your love is mature, like God's love for us, that is sacrificial and merciful and gracious, not selfish, if you really love in a mature way, you can get past anything in a relationship. You can forgive anything. You can move mountains if you really love and if you really are in God because your heart will be changed. You'll be different. You won't be like the world. You're not an unbeliever. Great privilege brings great responsibility. There is a need to move forward and forgive one another in Christ and not divorce. Even if you have to separate out for a while, we shouldn't do it for a long time, but even when you have to do that, because there is something that really is bad. And I'm not just talking about an argument or a disagreement. And you say, oh, I don't want to be with you anymore. Or, you know, you're a pain in the bum, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> you're a pain. You know, you're not helping me. You're not, you're not doing what I want you to do. You're not being the way I want you to be. Well, we're all different. But we, and we're going to fall out over little things. You don't put the cap on the toothpaste or you don't put your socks in a bag or something. Something's not going to be right. And this is what the men were doing in Moses' time and Moses had to give them a certificate because women were really being destroyed in these situations. And also the children. But because he issued a certificate of divorce, it wasn't because that's what God wanted. So God doesn't want divorce. And even if someone's an unbeliever, it's better you don't divorce. It's better you can work it out. But if you can't, then again, you let the unbeliever go. So if the unbeliever wants to divorce you, you let them. That's the command. And you carry on serving God and honoring God. And then you are not committing those situations. You're not going against what God's order is. But if you're in a marriage that is a godly marriage and you really love one another, you, your, your responsibility before God is to love your husband or your wife in God, in subjection to God, in submission out of reverence for Christ. You are supposed to submit and work things out together. There's always a middle ground. There's always something that you can do there is always an opportunity. Unless something is bad and someone's on drugs or they're being violent or you know, they're, they're off womanizing all the time or whatever, if they're doing something so bad and continually hurting you, then you might have to separate out. And maybe someone needs to come to their senses. Maybe someone needs to be touched by God. But if they don't and they want to continue their lifestyle and they would want to continue being disloyal and if they want to continue talking about you badly, if they want to continue going ab about your life and not honouring you and glorifying you and loving you in the right way, if they want to continue 
to dishonour you and to cause you pain and suffering, then of course it's not right to stay. Of course that's not right. That's wrong. But if we're talking about little arguments or little fights, you know, I'm talking about I'm not talking about violent fights. I'm talking about you know you really fall out. You don't talk to each other all day. Okay, but then. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. We need to get past it. We need to tell each other we love each other, even though we don't agree. You know, we have to agree to disagree in those situations and say, okay, well, I'm going to pray about my side and I'm going to pray that God is going to talk to you. <laughs> and that's all you can do. You can only change yourself. You can't change someone else. But, you know, we all have a different bottom line. You know, someone might have the bottom line at the toothpaste cap. And someone else might have the bottom line when someone's really treating them very, very badly, not just they're taking offence at every, everything that goes on. And, and so we all have the bottom line. And God is merciful. God is gracious. Sometimes people don't realise how they can psychologically abuse a person. So it may not be physical. It may not be a complete disloyalty in terms of, you know, not honouring them and not being loyal to them and so on it can just be something that upsets them and so we have to be aware that we have to work at it we have to look at ourselves take the plank out of your own eye before you start taking the speck out of your partner's eye this is where we this is where we have to work and then he says something that takes us completely away from this now he says verse 13 then they brought little children to him that he might touch them but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. So again, the disciples are getting it wrong, and it shows you that they're getting it wrong in, in big things and little things. They're not just getting it wrong on things they don't understand. The, 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 it's still ingrained. The disciples, it's ingrained. They're Jewish people under Jewish law, doing Jewish things, and their culture is, is making them do certain things and think certain ways. And when we become Christians, we come out of religion, when we're Christians, we start to need to think about being liberated and free. So we don't have to continue with our cultures and what the culture said. So if the culture is telling you you ought to be this way and you ought to act this way, and the world is saying you need to be this way or that way, God's saying something different. He's saying, no, you don't have to fit in with the culture. You don't have to stay in the way that you were brought up. You can be set free in Christ. You can be liberated to be the person that God wants you to be. And you don't have to keep holding on to those old things. And obviously you then have to start asking yourself, is this my thought or is it my parents? Have I been brought up in a certain way that my parents were racist or my parents uh, um, you know, believe that you know, there are certain ways to behave and live? And, and is this what I really think or is this an interjection from them? And now in Christ, when I've been set through from all that bondage of religious nonsense or atheism that was nonsense or whatever it was, now I have faith in Christ. Now I can be truly me the way Christ made me, which was between a man and a woman feeling not ashamed of being in a relationship and being a wife or a husband. I can be someone who is genuinely me in the sight of God in all my glory, the way God created me, without feeling any shame of whether I'm a man or a woman. If I think differently from a woman, I don't need to be ashamed of that. If I can't fully understand a woman, I don't need to be ashamed of that. In the same way, women are the same. They don't always understand men. They're not thinking or acting the same way as men, but they don't need to be ashamed of that. What we need to do is work together in subjection to Christ out of reverence for Christ, we need to work out our differences and realise that we complete one another rather than looking at the negatives of why we don't get on and why we don't see each other. We need to continue to look at the completion aspect and to make sure that we are right with God in our lives and how we treat our partners. Are we right with God? Are we, is our intention right or are we manipulating things to our own ends? Are we really honouring God by honouring our partners? Of course. If we are undermining our partners in any way, 
whether it be the male or the female, if we're undermining one another, if we're not taking each other seriously and we think we know better about everything, then that's not compromise, that's not working together, and that's not coming together as a unit. <coughs> we have to be one in Christ. That's the important thing here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.